my name is Rebecca. I am a human-centered design lead at 1904 Labs. I do user research and design on client projects. And I'm here with a former colleague of mine from my previous career in city planning. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Grace Kang. I work at Urban Strategies. We're a local nonprofit here in St. Louis that works in human capital building. We work with low-income residents, predominantly black and brown communities, and understanding what has caused the barriers for them to be in the lifestyles that they have, and thinking about those systemic barriers and how we break them down so that we are ensuring that they can live up to the best lives that they want for themselves. So we look at a lot of things like economic mobility, uh, we think about education, attainment, healthcare access, and overall what the encompassing people need. Currently, my work takes me into East St. Louis, and I work at a public housing site there. And today, I'm just going to be talking about some of my previous work before I started working for Urban Strategies in Transportation Planning and my backgrounds in Public Health and Urban Planning. So before we dive down uh, that path, um, I'm going to kind of ease into this. So we're most of us who work in technology, we're, we're comfortable with the design of screens, um, mobile, uh, desktop. Um, this, is, this is kind of our bread and butter. And we also, in user experience, have a foundation of thinking about the design of objects, right? The, the norm and doors here that say push, but you want to pull. Um, the, the, so the design and the psychology behind the design is also something that we're, we're familiar with. But what about the design and the experience of a design in our cities? Um, this is kind of where city planners, this is their, their focus. So they're thinking about the design and the experience of places where we live, where we work, and where we relax. So the foundation of, of really this talk today is to think about, um, well, first of all, it, it's interesting to learn about how other um, disciplines approach design problems, but really also we're thinking about the future of technology and that it's becoming increasingly immersive and it's changing the way that we experience cities. So there's really an opportunity for people who design cities and neighborhoods to have a conversation with people who design interfaces. Um, so that's kind of the, the starting point. Um, and augmented reality is one, is one example of of one of these immersive technologies. Augmented reality means that it, it augments actually what the physical world looks like. So it's different than virtual reality, which creates an entirely different world. So you can see in the bottom corner, um, this is a concept, it's not a live application, but um, you can see that it's adding these uh, captions on top of a picture that, that you would be looking at um, from your device. So there's a lot of opportunity here, and a lot of opportunity for conversations with people who are designing experiences in the public space, on the street, in parks, in neighborhoods, and people who are going to be designing experiences in the future that interact with that space. So again, uh, kind of the starting assumption before we get into talking about some planning concepts today is that we need to understand the design of the street if we're going to be designing experiences that interact with it. And Augmented reality, virtual reality, these aren't quite mainstream yet. There's a lot of um, cost, uh, pro, this prohibitive cost right now to building out those technologies. The glasses are really expensive. Um, so it might not, it's not quite clear exactly when those will become really mainstream. But um, uh, I think it's still important to start having this conversation. So to start us off, um, what is city planning? Well, who lives in cities? We do. People do. And uh, people need places to live. We need somewhere to have meaningful work and a livable wage. We need somewhere to relax with our families, with our friends, maybe a park, maybe bars. Um, and we need ways to get to those places. So this is the urban planning is a huge field. It covers a lot of ground. And um, we're only going to be talking about really two planning approaches today. These are just two approaches that we think are interesting and meaningful, but just kind of wanted to provide this umbrella. There's a lot of different uh, pieces of the field of urban planning, and urban design is kind of just one of them. So uh, the first uh, 
principle that we want to kind of talk about is how do you design a safe street? So this is a little bit of an interactive activity. Um, just sort of want to ask you to make some observations here. We can just sort of have people shout out, um, what, do you, what do you notice about this picture? What are you, what are you looking at? And feel free to state the obvious. The crosswalk seems strange. It seems strange? Why is that? <laughs> because there's, usually you see two white lines and it's blocked off, and this, thing, this doesn't seem perpendicular. Yeah, it's kind of at an angle. Uh, what else are people noticing in this picture? Metrolink stop, yep. Is there some transit nearby? There's a curve, yep. A lot of the different stop signs are to the route from on the street to the exit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, there's cars in the intersection. Uh, accessibility access of Yep, yep, that uh, red yep. demarcation um, helps you know that a wheelchair can, is entering the street, it's kind of a signal. Uh, great. Anything else? Anything else? I'm not sure if I can see the indicator to walk or stop. Yeah. So great. Yeah. So how would you feel? Um, so the next question is, um, would you feel comfortable crossing the street? No. Not right around the answer. <laughs> I wouldn't feel very safe. Okay. Can, can you tell me why? It's 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 too open. It doesn't feel in, well enough enclosed. Mm -hmm. No boundaries. Interesting. Great. Great. Others, how would you feel crossing the street? Seems very busy. Busy, there's like a lot going on. <laughs> Great segue. <laughs> um, here's just a little bit more information. If you turn to the right, this is what you're gonna see. We're not, we're not trying to pick on the trolley, but just, just this is some more information. Um, does that change how you would feel? So we're, we're thinking about some design decisions that were made and how that affects how we feel and what our experience is. Does this change anything about how you would feel oops, crossing the street here? Yes. Anyone? Yeah. Well, it's a great catch there, yeah. Um, so um, for this next quick exercise, Conjure up the picture of a grandparent you have, or maybe had in the past, or an eight-year-old that you know. Could be your own, could be a neighbor. Um, so conjure up that image of them, someone that you care about. Hold them in your mind. We're gonna, would you feel comfortable letting them cross the street here by themselves? No. Why not? Give me some whys. Super busy traffic. Um, so what we're doing here, you know, we're really just pulling out what are our observations um, of the design and connecting it to what that experience is. Experience is. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more how street design influences our behavior on the street. I'm going to hand it over to Grace. Yeah, so those are really good perceptions that you all noticed overall. One note also is to think about those with impairments or disabilities and how if you have a hearing or eyesight disability and how that might impact street design, not to pick on folks that do your type of work, but sometimes we don't think about disability as a forefront and how they interact with that sort of user technology. So one of the first things we wanted to chat about is just in general how streets are designed. And I think this is a really familiar concept here in St. Louis and how wide our streets are. So for example, the city of St. Louis is a city that was designed to inhabit up to about a million people. Right now our population at very best might be around 300,000. And so when you think about that, we have one third of the population still in existence, but our streets are still designed for trolleys and large vehicles to go through or higher traffic volumes, what we see is the streets are designed to be too wide. 
streets that cause people to drive the distance that, and space that they have. For example, a lot of the street design in St. Louis City is probably about 11 to 12 feet wide. On a typical interstate, your lane is about 12 to 13 feet. So why would you have that on a city residential street that should be designed for residents? Because those streets are designed in a way that gets you to drive faster and quicker. So one really good example of this is uh, in this image here, you see that out of your peripheral vision that if you're driving about 10 to 15 miles per hour, this is what you notice. You notice the pedestrians, you notice the different cars, the parked cars around you, but if you just increase increase that speed about 30 miles per hour, that center point where the photo is not blurry is what you notice. So now you don't notice the pedestrian as well or the people around you. So thinking about those two images, ideally when you're thinking about user design and who's interacting with the street, you want people to be able to notice their entire surrounding. But again, if streets are designed to be so wide and you're driving at the width of your lane, this is how quickly most people do drive. And you can probably think of your own local examples, depending on where you live, where you are trying to cross the street and you notice people are going 30 to 50 miles per hour, depending on the time of day. And then you have to think about who are those users, where are these streets that is designed and who are we designing them for and who benefits from that. So how do planners approach this problem overall? Well. What we're trying to do is educate people about street design and how we've designed them in a way has caused people to interact with them in a different way. So what we're trying to do is alter the driving behavior by changing the built environment. So that's advocating for uh, curb bump outs, for example, that's where it shortens the crossing distance if you're a pedestrian. Thinking about those images that Rebecca showed you in the Del Mar Loop. It's thinking about how maybe the crosswalks aren't best designed if you're visually impaired to know that the crosswalk's going at an angle, because how would you know that? Because of how you're getting out into the street is taking you in a straight line when really you're going, you should be going left to an angle, and there's no audio devices to give you a cue, one to know when to cross that street. So those are the type of things that we've been talking about overall. Sorry, <coughs> my throat's super parched today from allergies, so I'm gonna take a walk. Um, but, <clears throat> so, I'm gonna transfer back to my life as a transportation planner. As I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, I now work for a group called Urban Strategies in East St. Louis, but I actually was super involved in transportation planning here in the city of St. Louis for the last four years. And one of the major projects we did at Trailnet, for anyone who's not familiar with Trailnet, we are a transportation advocacy group for the region that promotes walking and biking and ensuring that all people have accessible transportation that is safe and affordable and equitable. But overall, one of the major projects we did here were what we call traffic calming demonstrations. So we were really looking at lighter, quicker, cheaper projects of how do we educate people on what street design is. Because a lot of people are kind of in stuck zones of how they want to design streets, what they think might mean for safe street design, and not always thinking about how do you interact with the community to understand what safety even means to that community and understanding what is it that that community even wants to see change? Because we can come in with the best ideas, the brand shiny new ideas, and put that on a neighbor saying, you have a high crash volume. This is a high crash intersection zone. And now we're going to tell you how we want to design it. It's not the best way to build trust and actually see something change over time. So <clears throat> the reason why this is so important right now for us to even just talk about street design and how streets are designed overall is that this is a chart that shows between 1990 and 2018. And you can see it in the text at the top, but what you might not see that well are the numbers. So in 1990, overall, we had about 6,482 pedestrian fatalities. Back in 2018, we had 6,227 estimated pedestrian fatalities. So for me, this brings a question of technology is getting better. In other words, we are also getting smarter with how we design our infrastructure, yet what we're seeing are numbers are increasing for the people walking on these streets at the rates of what they used to be in 1990. 
So what you also need to take a closer look at is, again, who is this even impacting? So from 2008 to 2017, pedestrian fatalities increased by 35%. And when combined with all other traffic deaths, that decreased overall, though, 6%. So if we're designing our cars to be smarter, we're designing um, our roadways to fit the car design, then we're not really designing it for the people who need to rely on walking or biking or using alternative forms of transportation to get there safely. And so the questions again raise, who are you designing? your products, your infrastructure for, and who do you leave out in that process when you don't do it holistically? Um, the reason why this project, or the project I'm about to talk about is very important to St. Louis, is that these numbers back in 2015 show that 12% of fatal traffic crashes in the US involved pedestrians. In the city of St. Louis, that figure is 36%. So again, it's um, how we designed our streets how we designed them previously and how we continue to maintain them to fit a population that does not exist here in St. Louis City. So one of the things that TrailNet did was we wanted to educate people and change the mindset of what traffic calming is. Traffic calming is exactly what it sounds like. How do you calm traffic? How do you get people to slow down the speed of driving? Um, and why we did this was important because there was a lot of mentality built into this region that if you shorten the lanes, if, I mean, sorry, if you narrow the lanes, then it's gonna cause a lot of traffic congestion. It's gonna cause a lot of backup. I'm already reliant on my car to get to point A to point B. So I don't want you to change how these lanes are designed. So this was our tool to educate people on what that even could look like and change that mindset overall. Um, how we did this, again, was through these lighter, quicker, cheaper, projects where we worked with the community and gathered their input on what streets they would like to see re redesigned, why that was really important to them, and bringing people together to see those changes. And so they were directly involved in our days of these pop-up demonstrations and redesigning the street that they had chosen to see different designs happen on. And then overall, Trailnet wanted to do this in four different neighborhoods to really talk about high crash intersection zones, high crash areas, but air, also areas that were in the most distress. So what you see overall in this image here are four different neighborhoods we've worked on when we did this project. We worked in two North City neighborhoods and two South City. Um, what you might not be able to read that well is in those bubbles, it shows <clears throat> the average speed. So we took the speed of people as they were driving without a demonstration and with a demonstration. And then we also looked at complete stops, rolling stops, and no stops. And what we saw, for example, in the Ville neighborhood that's in North City is that the average speed was about 30 miles per hour. With our demonstration, it went down to 17.4. And of course, we could talk about why the numbers decrease so drastically during a demonstration. One is, if you put a lot of colorful objects in the road, of course, people are going to slow down to observe what's going on. But that's also the idea of changing our infrastructure around us. When there's nothing impeding the way that we are driving as people, then we're going to keep driving as quickly as we can because it's human behavior, because there's nothing changing the way we're, that we're interacting with that street. So the overall impact doing these lighter, quicker, cheaper projects led to was we actually got a crosswalk improvement within a year of a demonstration. And this was again through buy-in with the residents in the local school that this crosswalk was um, built right in front of with some funding through MFH. And it was able to show the community that doing these small, lighter, quicker, cheaper projects were a great way to get investment and buy-in from the residents overall. So <clears throat> one thing that uh, we really wanted to touch on is why city planning is so important, but why it's really important that we do this with a racial equity lens. So in this graphic here, um, what you notice is children killed while walking compared to white kids. So if you are black African American compared to a white child, you are twice as more likely to die just for walking. And if you're a Latino, you're 40% more likely. And then even further looking at communities with continuous sidewalks and higher income neighborhoods, that's 90% of uh, areas have continuous 
sidewalks while in low-income na neighborhoods that's 49 percent and of course these are just some t statistics that Rebecca and I chose to pull but you can see more data out there that if you are low income, black and brown, and that if you have a disability or you're elderly, people are just less likely to stop for you and you are a target of traffic violence just because of the barriers of what's around you and how you look. Uh, so one of the main things that we really need to make clear though is equality versus equity. Just because we change policies or practices, or you build a nice infrastructure in a neighborhood does not mean you actually achieve equity. So in this image here, you notice that for equality, everyone is given the same size bike. But what you notice, of course, is the woman in the wheelchair can't even ride that bike. And then the two adults are different heights. And then the child can't even reach the seat. Equity is actually building this infrastructure, building these designs, thinking about who you're designing for and truly designing it in a way that benefits them individually and understanding what their limitation and their barriers are in order to make real change. So this is one of many examples of how we can work towards equity, but also keeping in mind that just because you thought you figured out one algorithm does not mean it served a different population in the way that it should. Um, so one thing that we really wanted to drive and help you all understand though is what is racial equity even to this region? Uh, after Michael Brown was killed back in 2014, Ford Ferguson came up with this definition of what racial equity means and how we're gonna work towards achieving it. They created a great report that has 189 calls to action, but how we as a region have chosen to define what racial equity is, is a state in which a person's life outcomes cannot be predicted by one's race. And we know that in this area, we have made a lot of historical decisions that have caused outcomes that we see today through policies and practices that were very, very intentional from the federal to the local government. So how many of you all have seen the redlining map for St. Louis City? Okay, so this is um, a really good example. Does anyone actually want to explain what redlining is and what they know and how that impacted St. Louis City? Does anyone feel comfortable? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm also a fan of co-educating <laughs> if anyone wanted to, to jump on with me. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's actually, um, I'll paraphrase what you said, but that is a really good explanation. I don't know if it started in 1937. This is a map we found from 1937. So redlining, as you were sharing, is that A and B were considered the good, desirable neighborhoods that realtors would show to white people. C and D were predominantly black, brown <coughs> communities that realtors would show as not the great neighborhoods to move to. But they would show C and D to the black community, but they wouldn't show A and B to the black community. So redlining is essentially a tool that was used to cause racial systemic divides. But redlining is one of many tools that realtors and other planners in the past have used. And it's not just realtors and planners. Again, this is uh, decisions that were made from the federal to a local level that were actually real policies that were in place that did not make this illegal to racially discriminate against people for the basis of the color of their skin. Um, and what we notice now is 73 years later, the impact that this has caused on the region here. And of course, there's other impacts that have caused it over time. It's not just redlining. Uh, it's economic investment that we've seen from the development community, where we do in investment overall. Um, as another key indicator of why St. Louis looks the way that it does, and other developers over time. But in this map, what you see on the left is the life expectancy comparatively in North City, it's 67 overall, but in Clayton, their life expectancy is 85. 
So it's a good driver to show that your zip code really matters in this region to determine how long you're going to live. And when you know that who lives in those communities, like I don't need to drive that point further because I think that most of us work in the St. Louis region, we see why this is so important for us to take in mind of like historical context. And then the map on the right just drives it in even further, looking at the classic Del Mar divide and looking at home value income and that if you live north of Del Mar, all of that drops. And if you look south in central West End, for example, that increases. Um, <clears throat> so one thing we, I wanted to add, because we didn't want to drop a bunch of statistics and I'm feeling bad about it, is what are we doing as a region to change this um, and how we look at racial equity and how we use a racial equity lens in urban planning in particular. So again, while I was working at Trailnet, one of the things that we did was we use a racial equity lens in making decisions and recommendations of how we were gonna advocate in the St. Louis City region. So one of the things we intentionally did was looking at how do we build better walking and biking connections through North City and South City and not just look through East and West. Because let's be real, the St. Louis city here <laughs> likes to put a lot of their economic development going east and west here from the Forest Park to the Arch. Yes, that is one way to solve the economic disparities we see here, but if you don't choose a holistic way of actually making the region better, again, it goes back to who benefits and who is harmed in that process when you don't actually make decisions that are truly beneficial for those that might need the support the most. So at Trailnet, we intentionally looked at how do we prioritize our advocacy agenda and our strategies. And then this is a map here, the blue line show where Trailnet chose to focus its advocacy efforts. Obviously it does not go as far north or first, as far south as we wanted, but at the same time, this is something we're hoping to achieve in the next five years, driving walking and biking infrastructure improvements, going north and south as a starting point. Um, so, can I get to Rebecca? <laughs> um, great, so I hope that got the wheels turning about um, what our experience is in the built environment, the influence and the impact and the cost and the harm that can happen from design decisions. So we're user experience professionals, so what can we pull away from all this? Um, we promised you some lessons, so the first, you know, we really need to design around the needs of the people. And you know, the invention of the automobile was um, kind of the technological frontier, one of them, in the last century. And it allowed for all this connectivity and economic activity that we didn't have before, which was a wonderful, really wonderful thing. But then we started building communities in a way that was really all about driving more, driving further, living further from where we work, and we kind of lost sight of frankly, those kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs of we need health, we need safety, we need connection. So now we're actually, we've designed our communities in a way that now we're paying these costs. We have aging communities, we have people who are living in neighborhoods, they, as they age, they may not be able to drive, and they're gonna be far away from um, the services that they need. And certainly technology offers opportunity there. But um, as a kind of takeaway, as we are um, designing and, and developing technological experiences and ones that integrate into the physical and built environment potentially, um, likely, we need to stay grounded in what are our fundamental human needs. And planning offers an example of how we sort of lost sight of that. Um, so Google actually has um, an a augmented reality app live, you can try the beta version right now on your phone. I took this picture the other day. Um, and they are, what's interesting is the, the photo with the fox um, is an early prototype, and it was really cool. And they, what they found, though, was um, probably what you all would guess, that the fox was kind of distracting. And uh, it was dangerous for people as they walked into the street. They expected the fox to do other things, maybe jump. Um, but really, what was the primary task of a navigation app to get us where you're going. So, um, and to keep you, get you safely there. So, you know, that, that primary human need, of course, at the very bottom of, of Maslow's pyramid of physical safety, they ditched the fox. Now, um, in October 2019, the beta version, there's no fox, 
there's arrows helping you to navigate. Um, but what's really interesting is if you start walking for more than about five seconds, you get a black screen. It tells you put your phone down while you're walking. This is really, really interesting. I encourage you to check it out. But um, just um, things for us to continue thinking about. Uh, we have to design for all ages and abilities. And this is a, a differentiator when you're designing in the built environment, you're designing cities, because they belong to all of us. So even if we are designing an application or an experience that maybe has a specific persona in mind, and that's okay, we still need to be mindful of the other users in this, in this space, in this context, and especially make sure that we don't do them harm. Um, so that's something else for us to think about. We need to design a process that empowers those who are impacted. And TrailNet really has some great examples of how they work with communities, really co-create. Co um, and there's opportunities for us in technology to increasingly engage our end users and really make them part of the creative process with us so that they have a piece of the ownership. And in the lens of like thinking about technology, augmented reality that has this intersection with the built environment, this is especially important because what's unique about planning um, and designing in the built environment is that we feel emotion attached to place. It's just a human thing. We feel this emotional attachment connected to where we live. And that's an, actually an opportunity for us in technology. We can um, leverage that and, and learn, feel more connected to where we live. Maybe see our environment, um, our neighborhoods, maybe the way they looked in the past. You know, there's educational opportunities, but um, really to be mindful of the emotions and, and how, our, how the experiences we're designing will impact the people who are in the space and live there. And last but not least, um, we have to design for racial equity. This isn't something that just happens on its own. Um, and there's consequences uh, when we don't plan for it. Uh, people get left out. Um, our, our world becomes narrower. It's, it's kind of easy to imagine, potentially, an augmented reality experience that is completely um, dictated by a one kind of person's lens of that city. But what about all of the other diverse experiences that make our environments, our cities, interesting places to live and have really rich histories that we want to know about and we want people to be able to bring their voice to urban conversations? Um, this is a picture of Joy Buonini, who is doing that. She's at MIT. I don't know, has anyone seen her TED Talk? It's really cool um, and depressing. But uh, <laughs> she, her work is, is important because um, she's testing the facial recognitions of software, a facial recognition software at big tech companies, a bunch of them she tested, and found that they were far less accurate at identifying women of color. So not only were they less accurate at, um, they misgendered women, first of all, all women, these um, facial recognition algorithms, and they didn't recognize with the same level of accuracy um, women of color as opposed to, or darker skin as opposed to lighter skin until she put on the white mask that you see in this photo. And then the software was equally accurate or as accurate as it was at um, identifying white men. So um, as we're designing experiences, we need to be intentionally inclusive and make sure that we are mindful of the centuries of bias that we all have from living in this country um, so that we are designing experiences that um, are really inclusive. So. Quick recap, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, we started with the assumption that, A, it's interesting to learn about how design problems are solved in different disciplines, and really, B, the future of technology is moving into this direction of more immersive experiences, and particularly experiences that layer our technology, our screens, on top of uh, public spaces. So that was kind of a starting assumption. Then we talked about two kind of approaches to planning that we wanted to share with you. As I said, there's, there's lots of different approaches. Those are just two that we kind of pulled out. Um, safe street design, um, designing a street for all ages and all abilities, and designing with a racial equity lens. 
And then we sort of decided, okay, what can we pull away from what planning's been done? What can we learn from what's been done in our cities? And use those lessons to think about as we move forward and our experience in cities changes because of technology. Um, so that's sort of the, the summary. We have a couple minutes for some questions, discussion, comments. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, so that's a good question. So the question was how to approach community members, build relationships, and trust. I will just go from some personal experiences, particularly me being a transplant to St. Louis. I moved here about four and a half years ago. I learned a lot about St. Louis history after I moved here and learned about the racial divides, the systemic racism in this region. So I never go into a neighborhood thinking I'm an expert on anything. And I think that it's really obvious when you come in with preconceived notions of a community, of the people you're interacting with, whether that's your body language, your mannerism, how you talk to people. So I try to go in with a clean slate with no idea of stereotypes and misconception and just treat them in, in the way that I would treat any friend or family member. And that's just to get to know them. Um, I think that also going into a neighbor that you're trying to win their buy-in, it's important to not make your ask right away if you have no existing relationship with anyone there. So if you're trying to make an ask, obviously start with someone you might already know who might be willing to open the door for you to help you make those relationships. But if you don't know anyone, you're going in there with an idea like, hey, I can save this North City community, like just stop there. <laughs> um, really do your research and your understanding and how you build trust. There's actually kind of a really interesting framework through their University of Minnesota's extension. They have four um, ideas of what trust is and how we look at trust as a foundation in our engagement work. And then there's another one called trauma-informed community building of how do we build relationships on top of layers in order to make systemic changes that we're looking for. But for me, it's just really working more on the caring side of trust, which is the softest side of trust. Of If you really are trying to make a difference in the communities that you're serving, it's one to never overpromise, to not go in there as an expert and to really be intentional and upfront with what you can actually do. Because most communities at this point are looking for honesty. They're not looking for false promises. And they're not asking any of us to be their savior in any sort of way, because they are their own experts in knowing how to work within their communities overall. So it's really just listening and then actually doing what they ask you to do. timelines and keep people from just completely losing interest, losing focus from the, the process of the design data collection stage where you're doing that, the, the, the beautification or the, the project with the flowers on the street to the point where you get the crosswalk installed. Because I imagine that that's not happening over two weeks, it's happening over a longer period. So yeah. how do you maintain the momentum and the interest over that period? Do you want to talk about Um I think that work is, is hard work. Um, it's, you know, it's an investment in relationships and it's hard work. Relationships are hard work. So um, I, don't, I don't know what else really add. There's like, you know, community meetings, there's, you know, porch conversations. I've spent a lot of time just on the pavement kind of building trust with people. Um, but yeah, it is, that is a unique sort of piece of, uh, this kind of these kinds of problem solving and projects is just the timeline of it. But I think when we think about um, we're we're out of time, okay. so I'm so sorry. We can connect more we're, later. We're gonna uh, yeah, Grace and Rebecca will be here. You can uh, catch them in the back of the room. If you haven't had lunch, right now is your opportunity to go get lunch. If you've had lunch, uh, we're gonna have Roberta Moore in here in about 15 minutes, 10 minutes. 
we ran a little over, uh, talking about emotional intelligence and why you should care about it. Um, if you eat really fast, you could catch.